Optimization is a very deep and complex topic of which a lot of developers don't truly understand. So this series is going to be kind of diving deeper into Unreal Engine's different tools for optimization um, and different ways to optimize different pieces. Um, so today we're starting with something I see asked about a lot, um, which is actually render targets and scene capture components as a whole, as a piece, as a unit. And so we're going to be talking about how we can optimize these as well as things to watch out for. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So to get started, we're going to be looking at something here for my game that is a navigation ball, is a 3D UI element within my game. Now, there are ways to optimize this outside of what we're going to show here today in terms of you can create this using other methods. Um, for example, I have heard people talk about HLSL, uh, which is basically like a code programmatic way to create a material that would simulate what my 3D object does. Now, today we're going to be talking about random targets, so I'm not going to dive into um, how to optimize there, um, but specifically, we're wanting to replicate this motion here. Now, as you can see there, that one is um, running a little behind. Let me actually correct that here. Um, I was playing around with the tick rate on here. Um, that way I could make sure I give you all the best possible information. So let's go ahead and start back up. All right, so now you can see this is what it currently works like. You know, very smooth and it rotates properly and you can go all the way around and it's a th full 3D object. Um, so you can actually rotate the full 360 degrees. It is a fully functional nav ball. So let's get into how we can actually optimize this to make it a little bit more performant. First, let's actually take a look at what our um, stats really are. Because before you before you get worried about you know optimization, you want to look at where you're running and you know what kind of optimization targets you might want to set. So as you can see here, um, technically my game thread is eating most of my uh, performance. So of course you know this isn't going to have as much of an impact on my overall performance because this is probably going to be sitting more on my GPU time. But as you can see here, we're sitting at about a 9.5 on the GPU time. So let's see if we can cut that down any. Uh, and this will help a little bit on game time because there's some calculations and stuff going on that we are going to be tweaking a little bit. Um, but a lot of this is going to be GPU time. But as you can see here, we're getting roughly 13.2 to about 13 in terms of the game slash frame time because our game time is our highest um, value. And that's what your frame time is because you can only go to the next frame once you've completed all your calculations. Sometimes it looks like it jumps up to 14 because it looks like the AI is doing some stuff in the background. Um, our draw is about 7.5 and our GPU is about 9.5. So let's go ahead and go into our actual objects here. So this is the actual texture that the render target paints to. Now, as far as this goes, you have a few options here. You have some bitmap settings that you can tweak. Um, usually I don't mess with these too much because they tend to make things look a little blurry. Um, you also have the texture size, so you can scale these um, to be different scales. And if you do so, this does have an impact on um, the actual performance because it's a higher resolution. You're going to get a prettier, crisper image. Uh, but as you can see here, once things settle down a bit, yeah, we're generally having a higher GPU usage. So let's go ahead and cut that back a little bit. And of course, depending on you know what scale you're wanting to really cut back to, you could go pretty far. Um, just be aware that the further you cut back on the resolution here, um, the blurrier your object could end up looking. So see how I've dropped it down to 512, and now it's it's you know it's not looking too bad. Um, we're still hitting about the same um, frame time here. Let's see. Yeah, in fact, we have a slightly higher frame time. Likely do some stuff running in the background. So let that settle a little bit. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, now we've settled down into our normal. So we're hitting about 12 and about 13 and a half, 14. So you can see here, and occasionally you see it's dipping to 11 a little bit. Um, so we haven't really affected too much by that simple change. And that's why, for the most part, I recommend this gets mostly left alone. Um, it can be optimized for memory and things like that, but um, it's not necessarily going to be the end-all be-all when it comes to actually 
um, optimization. That's going to be in here. So this is my object. I've got my scene capture component. I've got my actual ball here, and then I've got all my little elements. And so what you're going to want to do is actually, if you come in here, um, you've got a few options for optimization. So one of the big ones is going to be on your scene capture component. Um, there's something called capture every frame. Now what that does is this means every single frame on tick, basically, it's going to try and capture a new frame. Now that can be handy when you're moving very fast. Uh, but for example, if you're just heading one direction, not moving a whole lot, that's a whole lot of wasted overhead. So instead what we can do is we can uncheck capture every frame. And now we just have it capture on movement and always persist rendering state. Now this one was not turned on by default. I turned this on. Um, what this does is if you have uh, motion blur or temporal AA, it means that any kind of calculations that need to be done can be done to it. Now, not for what we're going to do, we're going to turn off a lot of those options because for my nav ball, it's not really necessary. But if you add something that might have motion blur or temporal AA, um, it could be handy to have that turned on. And then we also got the max view distance override. So what this does is this calls distant objects from your camera's view. Um, so that way you're not rendering things that are way off in the background because um, this is an object that could be dropped into your world. For example, that's how I'm using it. It's dropped into my world, but very far away. So that way when my um, nav system, my UI actually picks it up, it doesn't see anything in the background, but this is also another way you could override it by saying, setting it's like a hundred or something short like that. And this is, I believe in Unreal Units. Um, so take that into account when you're setting that as well. Let's go ahead and here are some more options. So we've got our clipping. You can also enable clipping, um, but for me, the big ones are gonna be these flags. These flags are where you actually can um, disable a lot of things, especially if you're using it for a UI element. So since I am, I can pretty much turn all of these things off. In fact, we can even turn these off. Yeah, because this is basically have no lighting. It's a UI element. So we can also turn off the Nanite because we're not going to be using Nanite. Um, we do want to show it in game. Um, because I believe these these are basically um, hidden show flags. So like, if in game for some reason it was it was hidden, um, you should still be able to see this item. All right, so that is pretty much everything there turned off, and that alone should hopefully net us at least some gains in that section there. Let's let everything settle down. Give the GPU some time to. Oh, sorry, I must have turned off one incorrect option here, I believe. Um, static meshes, okay. Static meshes you wanna make sure you leave on because of course you don't want to not actually render what you're trying to render. <laughs> um, um, performance here. Um, and that is going to be on our event tick. So this actually uses a event tick um, to actually call this to update every, every frame. Now, of course, we don't necessarily have to update every frame. Um, with event tick, um, you can actually tweak how often it gets called. And for an object like this, you know, it's more of a UI element. You don't necessarily have to call it every frame, um, but you still want it to look smooth because it is going to be moving. And so if we set it to something like, let's say 0.05, because um, I believe 0.01 is technically um, uh, like very close to being like tick itself. Um, cause that's zero, zero is tick. Um, so set it something like 0.05. So it's low enough that we should see it still move pretty smoothly. But that alone is actually going to help reduce how often those calls are made. And then um, one thing we're gonna wanna be aware of though, is that since we're not capturing every frame um, that we will occasionally see some weirdness. And so what we can do is instead of doing this capture on movement, um, what we can actually do is disable that because um, that basically will act kind of like a vent tick in that it will capture pretty frequently because it basically any movement that um, it the camera detects, it will try and, and do that. And sometimes it can be a little weird about, you know, when it detects movement. And so you could have situations where it doesn't actually update when it should be and vice versa. 
So what we can do actually is on this event tick is actually just call the capture scene directly. And what that means is it's still going to be relatively smooth, but it's going to be even more performant because we're only going to be actually updating um, the capture whenever we're actually, you know, calling that event tick. And there are some other optimizations we could do as well. And you see here as it drops down, as it sort of normalizes out, um, you'll see those numbers go down. There we go. Um, but one thing we can also do to sort of smoothen this out a little bit um, is actually go to here. Um, and so when it comes to actually how often you call this event tick, um, this is an option you have that I'm not doing here. Um, but for example, on your actual player class, since it is nav ball controlled by the player, instead of calling event tick, you could have an event driven um, system. The hard part is my ship actually continues to drift after you've stopped turning. Um, so we'll actually come to a stop, you know, shortly after. Um, so you have to be careful with situations like that. That's partly why I'm using event tick. It's a lot simpler and a lot easier to use um, than figuring out the math of like how long you keep sending events to update the direction the player is facing. Uh, versus this just calculates and checks um, every, you know, half second or so. And you can just tweak it, you know, as time goes on, you know, maybe you go to point one and notice, you know, okay, that is that still smooth enough for what I need? Um, or does that start eating its performance? So let's go ahead and accelerate. You see it's a little choppy and feels a little bit laggy there. Um, it is working, but it just feels and looks not as smooth as, you know, I would prefer. And so this is probably something that, you know, we'd want to check more frequently to so go, okay, so that is, you know, not often enough versus before it was, you know, it was working. So you do something like 075, you know, kind of right between the two. There you go, that feels a lot smoother. Um, it may not be as perfect as, you know, the 0.05, but I, to me, to the visual eye, I don't see any problem with this. And most of the time when I'm looking at this, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty much what I was expecting to see. Now, something that you may not notice here um, is there's actually something missing from my UI element. Um, so there are some prograde and retrograde icons that I use. And so the question is, why can't I see those? So when I turned off all those options, I actually ended up turning off um, one of the options here in the scene component that has actually made those not visible inside the camera. Well, why is that? Well, I have a static mesh here and I've got a material. So you'd think with static mesh that that would actually show that. But if we actually go into our scene capture component here, we're gonna to wanna to turn on translucency because for our actual items here, these are gonna be things that um, we wanna be able to see the actual translucency on. And now that's on, boom, we can see them again. Um, you would think it would be something related to stack meshes, but because of the fact that they have translucency on them, um, that is what actually causes them to turn invisible. But yeah, so that is pretty much everything for this. Um, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to see a tutorial about, definitely leave a comment down below. But otherwise, good luck and good hunting.